Every child of the 90s is very familiar with the aura and excitement of the Saturday morning cartoon. Most came with an onslaught of merchandising, and if they were really successful, they would sometimes even get a video game adaptation. The Tick cartoon based off of the comic book of the same name achieved success in the 90s. It is precisely one of these examples that ended up being lucky enough to get a video game treatment. But in an era of such bad movie to game and TV to game adaptations, does the Tick stand out amongst the rest? Or is it predictably bad like the majority of every other video game adaptation from the 16-bit era? I have a glow you cannot see! I have a heart as big as the moon, as warm as bath water! We are superheroes, man! We don't have time to be charming! I'll start off by saying that as a kid I was a fan of the Tick cartoon show. The quirkiness of the characters and the witty dialogue was a long departure from the more serious comic book cartoons like Batman or X-Men, which I also watched. The Tick was essentially a show that made fun of the ridiculous behavior of dressing up in costumes to fight crime, and I loved it. So when browsing through the glass window of the video game shelf in the local Toys R Us, being met with the box art of the Tick video game, I knew I had to have it. Prior to the internet, this is a mistake that most kids of the time are guilty of. Buying a game of a show or movie you admire, and not knowing anything about the actual game itself. Let me start with the positives of this game. The game starts with a very basic title screen, and away you go. In the first level that you start in, you're on a moving bus where you fight ninjas. Seeing all the movement behind you as you fight is actually kind of cool. You pretty much get a sense of the controls and basic combat skills that you'll be using in the game from here, and they're relatively simple. The jump button is responsive, and the punching and kicking is quite good. However, the punching is kind of weird because the Tick's arms are so small that he doesn't get much of a reach on enemies, so you're probably going to end up using the kick for the vast majority of the game. An additional feature I liked was if you're really in a bind, you'll get to call upon Arthur, your sidekick, by pressing the X button. He'll come to your aid and swoop down across the screen to get rid of enemies faster. However, you only get three times to do this, but it can be maxed out to four times in the options menu at the start of the game. The only other varying level of gameplay that exists is when you see a white fist on the ground, if you grab it, you'll get an ally character from the show to do a back-to-back -back tag team with you to help take on the enemies. Most of them do help, but the Bat Manual character does nothing. He just stands there, and after he takes the first hit, he disappears. It honestly slows you down, and I purposely got him killed most of the time just so he could get off my back. Having some kind of context or story that related to the levels that you are situated in would have been ideal, but after a while, it didn't bother me as much as I just kind of excused this game as having more of an arcade style. The first little bit of this game does hold itself together in spite of the repetitive style of gameplay. It's your classic side-scrolling beat-em-up game. The beginning of where the annoyance comes from are these interludes of gameplay where you're just jumping and trying to avoid objects being hurtled at the tick from enemies and unknown whereabouts. Some of the objects are impossible to avoid, and if you try to figure out a pattern, it feels like you're just making things worse. I just decided to jump and hope for the best in these interludes. These levels feel like they are designed just to take away your lives, and it does the job as you progress. The repetitive gameplay does set in quite quickly after the first 30 minutes. Nothing new happens after that. No different style of gameplay whatsoever. And the music is reused in different levels. There is literally only five songs in the 44 levels of this game. And yes, you heard correct. This game has 44 levels. It took me about three and a half hours to beat this game. The biggest problem with this game is that it doesn't know when to stop. It keeps going and going without the gamer ever having any sense of an end in sight because there is no narrative. Each new level just gets thrown at you with no sense of when things may start to dull down. I was shocked at how unnecessarily long this game is. This game should have stopped at the chair-faced boss fight, which was around the two and a half hour mark, and even then, that would still be too long. The developers could have easily gotten rid of 20 levels to shorten its time, and could have added some different gameplay, like a car level, or maybe a level where you play as Arthur flying. The game suffers from a lack of variety, and for three hours, having different backdrops and different enemies just isn't enough to hold the gamer's attention. 
It gets boring from all the punching and kicking. Around the two hour mark, you get introduced to a mountain level that has an isometrical style of level design where you get to walk upwards. And alas, this is the beginning of where the game truly starts to fall apart due to glitches. Enemies began to get stuck in invisible walls and I'd have to call upon Arthur to put them out of their misery because I couldn't even punch or kick them. And then there was this. This guy literally floated up into the air and was stuck in the clouds, where I could not even get to him. I mean, how? He's up in the clouds. Why did this happen? I tried everything to get him down. I ran back and forth. I called upon Arthur once again. I jumped upwards where he was. I even purposely jumped to my own death a few times, but nothing worked. So I inevitably had to restart the game from the beginning because of this glitch. I couldn't move forward no matter what I tried. Luckily on my second playthrough, it didn't happen again, as I was overly cautious not to disrupt anything that I felt would break the game again. I do appreciate that the game designers were trying to make the levels more interesting by implementing this isometrical view, but it just doesn't work. I've also never played a game in my life where I had to walk off screen in order to have the enemies show up, and you'll be doing that a lot on these mountain levels. As you progress in the game, the backdrops are so out of context that they don't really make any sense a lot of the time. Like, why am I in a forest now? Why am I picking up a bear and throwing it? Now we're at a carnival. Now we're at the beach. It just seems like they were checking off a list of every single backdrop they could place in the game. Is this guy okay? Should somebody check on him? What's a sewer doing in a cave? Wait, weren't you in the street before? But I digress. The first big glitch I encountered was at the isometrical mountain, where we had the floating man. The second was at a mountain interlude where I couldn't jump off a rock because I was stuck. I died and it was game over. Luckily, there is a stage select code I found online and started from that very point where I died at. As I continued on throughout the levels, I thought that the game glitched so hard that it started making up the game as it went along. I thought I was going crazy. With a three and a half hour runtime, I'm not surprised that there would be so many glitches I would encounter. This game is just too long for its own good to be contained and consistent. The cake level is by far the most frustrating boss in the game. It's incredibly difficult. And it's almost as if the game doesn't want you to continue. The physics and timing feels off. All you can really predict from this boss fight is that the clown up on top, for some reason, has such a range to throw these bombs at you, and the bombs are non-stop. The clown is constantly hitting you with very little opportunity to hit him or any of the other objects coming out of the cake at certain points. Also on the final boss, prior in the game mechanics, you were able to do a jump kick in the air, and for some reason, the game designers disabled it in this fight. The ending is sort of the biggest punch in the gut. It's just a screen that says, the end. It's the same screen you get when it's a game over. No quirky dialogue between the Tick and Arthur or any of his superhero friends, no riding off into the sunset cutscene, or standing on a tall building looking over the city you just saved. It's just a the end screen. That's all you get after three and a half hours. I do find it strange that the game developers took so much time to make such a long game, and then to have such an anticlimactic conclusion at the end of it all. Three and a half hours to sit in front of this game in one sitting is a long time. It has no save features or password features for you to come back to if you want to take a break. It's just a long, long playthrough. In total, I spent about five and a half hours with this game, between glitches and restarts. That's way too much time to be spending on a game like this. Unfortunately, the Tick game is not worthy of the time it commands you to sit in front of it, with its low tier payoff, which is essentially nothing in the end. I can't really say that I recommend this game even though it is nostalgic for me. Maybe if you decided to play it with a friend to bond over on how tedious it is, or if you're looking for something hilariously frustrating to experience and say, I did it, I survived the Tick game, then of course, you can join the club too. Thank you for joining me on this episode. If you like what you've seen and heard, give us a like and subscribe. This is Dusty Maxwell, 
and we'll see you on the next episode of The Select.